Man and woman are two equal halves of one whole. What we, the brotherhood of illuminates, the enlightened ones in Christ consciousness, are about to tell you is of vital importance to the world generally. We speak equally to Christian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and to every religion and every race of the world. We speak to all because each and every one in the world needs this instruction to make it possible for you to move on to higher levels of spiritual awareness. Your personal and sexual relationships between men and women are of far more importance to your overall well-being than you can presently even imagine. We deal with these relationships at length in the following pages, only because it is absolutely imperative, vital, for you, men and women, to wake up to the basic reality of your male or female individuality and identity and true source of gender differences. You must fully understand the true origins of your male and female bodies and characteristics. They are not just bodies created with differing physical organs and modes of sexual expression in order to create children. They draw the origins of their masculinity or femininity from their very source of being, from within the equilibrium of universal consciousness. I am telling you this before you read letter 5, so that you will study that letter bearing in mind what I am telling you now about your sexuality. Therefore, if the sexuality of a man and woman is not used in conformity with the divine consciousness intention expressed in the original act of creativity at the time of the Big Bang, it is obvious that although the sexuality may produce children, it will not bring to men and women the unity of being and personal fulfillment and joy it was meant to bring. In fact, the reverse is true. Eventually, the sexual act itself brings disappointment and satiation, after which any love previously felt by, par felt by partners drains away. With knowledge and understanding, spiritually based men and women will make every attempt to transcend their present state of consciousness in regard to male-female relationships of any kind no matter what those relationships may be, sexual or otherwise. They will strive to express within their minds and hearts the purposes for which they were created in different forms. They will understand the origins of their differing innate impulses, temperaments and modes of self-expression, and will value them. They will use their differences to enhance the well-being of each other. Competition will disappear. As this happens, they will tune into divine consciousness ever more easily. As they tune into divine consciousness ever more easily, so will they ascend into higher levels of spiritual consciousness. At the moment, your approach to your sexuality is your barrier to your ascension in consciousness. It roots you in your humanhood. I, we, cannot emphasize sufficiently that you have not discovered the truth of your existence until you have fully understood and sought to implement in your daily lives, in your homes and workplace, your full comprehension of the true meaning of man and woman. You have been told that you must not commit adultery. But I tell you that when you desire your neighbor's wife or husband, you are making pictures in your thoughts which will affect the thinking of your neighbor's wife or husband. He or she will begin to think about you in the same way or will feel uncomfortable in your company feeling your sexual need, and will avoid you in future. 
what is in your mind will surely come into being in the world. So do not fool yourself that you can daydream and conjure up pictures pleasing to yourself which will damage no one else. For this reason, your pornography literature is truly a blasphemous desecration of your source of being. It is a sexual scourge deliberately whipping up sexual appetites, releasing through lustful men's minds untold suffering and misery on the bodies, minds, and emotions of female young. What you have perpetrated and are presently doing has helped bring your civilization to its present edge of destruction. Rest assured, the day of reckoning will come for you who publish and distribute the printed sickness, and it will come for those who use it to arouse themselves. You, in the Western world, have earned the contempt of the East due to your decadent foolishness. You will not escape what you have sown. And you of the East will not escape your foolishness in your callous attitudes towards your women who bear and raise your sons and precious daughters. Some of you, in ignorance of truth, for your own selfish purposes and gain, have made a mockery of the truth of Muhammad. You have shrouded your women in heavy garments, denying them freedom of movement and of Allah's fresh air as they venture out amongst other people. To what kind of man will your beliefs and your irrational, egocentric behavior appeal? Only to men who have no kindly feeling for women. Is it such followers that your prophet Muhammad would have attracted when he was on earth? No, indeed. He appealed only to the most spiritually minded people. What kind of imagery or picture of your prophet are you sending out to the rest of the world? I will tell you of a man demented and obsessed by the lowly state of the female sex who regarded a woman as a man's possession to be imprisoned from the world. A man unaware of a woman's true needs to be happy a man oblivious of her misery in the captive, subjected state. This man has nothing whatsoever to do with the true Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. When on earth, he revered and respected the female sex. It was from the female of the species he derived the means to move forward on his spiritual path to enlightenment. He owed them much, and knew that, although they were different in body, they were equal in spirit. In fact, it was no accident that he came to earth, poor and deprived, to meet a lady of extreme virtue, material wealth, and spiritual insight, to help raise him up to the stature of profit when he was fitted to fill it. That was the purpose behind Muhammad's coming to earth to restore woman to her rightful place as equal partner of dominant man. Consider this well. After enlightenment, I, in the person of Jesus, became celibate because I chose to do so. But this in no way interfered with my love for the women who ministered to my needs. But Muhammad after enlightenment, knew many women, and his ministry was of one who was called upon to learn how to live and deal with women equitably and with love. Just as expediency caused my followers to report my doings and teachings selectively to promote their own purposes, so has the selfishness of certain spiritually blind individuals caused them to distort Muhammad's original teaching with numerous additions and interpretations never intended by Muhammad. In such a way is every great spiritual teacher's work overlaid by the misinformation of human thought until the truth is so shrouded in fallacies that people are led seriously astray 
and even caused to sin in ignorance. Because you and certain other religions have strongly adhered to the belief in Adam and Eve created to live in happiness in the Garden of Eden, of Eve's temptation by the serpent, her fall from grace, and her temptation of Adam, man has been encouraged to perceive woman as the great temptress. The imagined origins of humankind are not true. They are merely allegories. Neither is it true that woman is the great temptress. For eunuchs, the woman has no appeal. Why is this? Because that which impels a man to lie with a woman is removed. Therefore, in whom is the tempter? In man himself? And can be physically removed from him? Or in the woman who remains herself despite all? Man has been made expressly to plant the seed. Therefore, to plant the seed, he must, wherever he sees the opportunity. Woman has been made to receive the seed. In past years, before the 20th century, women were sexually dormant until seduced by men. Where then the tempter? In men? the arousers and seducers, or in women, the seduced and aroused. Man has been hiding from his own masculine nature in the name of purity and placing the responsibility for his downfall on woman. Is this a sacred activity? Is it worthy? Should it continue? We speak to those of you who profess to adhere to the Muslim faith and who believe you are sinless or of pure mind because you have shrouded your women in heavy clothes to protect yourselves from temptation and prevent other men from seeing your possessions. How greatly are you misled by your own passions? By being protected from the exercise of your human desires, they only increase until they break out in some virulent, brutal form. I, we, say to men and women everywhere, true purity is only attained when you can be surrounded with every form of temptation and yet remain untouched by desire, unmoved by earthly feelings, untainted by earthly lusts, free of craving and longing for possession. Purity, in its every form, transcends all earthly physical hungers. Purity is the ability to see temptation for what it is, grossness of thought and feeling, which traps the senses of men and women into doing unclean things. A truly pure person desires only the clean and honest environment suited to their innate longing for spiritual love and beauty of self-expression in every facet of their lives. That is true purity. However, true purity cannot be achieved unless there have first been the long years of temptation. It is a necessary part of your spiritual development. Unless you have been sorely tempted at times and have eventually come to understand that there is a higher road to walk, a road of self-denial, and of sincere concern and caring for a good woman, you will never attain a state of true purity. You will be enslaved by desire and will be in a constant turmoil of inner conflict. Therefore, do not avoid temptation by covering women and living in artificial conditions of pseudo-purity. Rather, men and women, remove your clothes Revere each other's bodies as the outer visible beautiful forms of the inner divine consciousness and experience the release that true spiritual purity will bring you. 
suffer grievous temptation, and overcome. Take your conflict to divine consciousness and seek its power to help you overcome your physical longing, for only in this way will you find the freedom, the peace of mind you are basically seeking. If, at the moment, you seek relief and release of your craving by giving way to it, that is no freedom or release. The self-same craving will return in due course, and once again, you will know the searing conflict. If again you give way, again the conflict, even more intense, awaits your decision to stand firm in the power of divine consciousness until the craving is finally subdued by perceiving the sacred beauty, the reality behind and within all physical form. The highest spirituality between the sexes is when man and woman can be together naked and at peace together in a state of mutual reverence of soul, mind, heart, and body. In such spirituality, all they feel for each other is love and regard for the well-being of the other. Out of such love and compassionate, tender caring will come a union of ecstatic being that few have experienced. And if intended, a child of incomparable beauty of body and mind will be conceived. In the centuries ahead, when people have begun to evolve spiritually on every level of their humanhood, such a love between partners will be normal. And the kind of selfish sex, seeking only physical satisfaction, as indulged in at this present time, will be regarded as utterly degrading, as abhorrent as rape. At the present time, the highest spiritual way to follow in regard to the sexes is to acknowledge and abide by the perception that men and women were created to perform special tasks in life suited to their underlying natures. The man impregnates the woman. Without the woman's good will and help, the man would go to the end of his days childless, without a human being to carry on his name. Therefore, the man should treat a woman as wholly equal but born to carry different responsibilities. He should give her the highest respect and love and care at all times to enable her to carry her burdens with greater ease. For it is she who gives visible form to what is first conceived in mind. When a woman receives a sperm which unites with her ovum within the recesses of her body, a miracle is wrought to which you, the man, have done nothing to contribute other than your sperm in a moment of delight, in which is your reward. You can only contribute to the continued health and normal development of the miracle you have given life to in your partner's body by your unfailing, caring love for her well-being and help and protecting her from all emotional and external harm. This is your masculine responsibility. Only in this way do you deserve to remain at her side as father of her child. If you fail in this, you have no value as father to the child and have no value to yourself as a man born to manifest your spiritual divine consciousness father within your physical life. A man who harasses a woman carrying his child, who treats her with contempt, who offers harsh and brutal words and physical treatment, is breaking the most fundamental law of existence in which male and female should be united in equality of divine beingness. Women who are respected and loved and protected should equally respect and love and offer refreshment of spirit and body to her partner, nurturing his capacity for giving of himself to her. A woman who does not nurture her partner with caring, 
tenderness and love, is depriving his masculine spirit of the will to endure in face of difficulties he encounters in the external world. He will seek his solace from another source, men or women, drink or drugs, or by isolating himself within the household, of use neither to partner nor children. Therefore, men and women have an equal responsibility to cherish each other. Just as the man must learn to channel daily the father aspect of divine consciousness towards family and work, so must woman learn to express the mother aspect of divine consciousness in her daily life. Those who deny this truth will be denied access to the celestial kingdoms until they have increased their spiritual perception and prayerfully changed their attitudes. Only when their vision is lifted above the earthly human perception of male and female and beyond their earthly desires and ego drive to the reality out of which they have drawn their being will they escape the wheel of reincarnation and find entrance to the ultimate joy and glory. If, within a culture, a woman is regarded only as a possession, an object of a man's desires, and not treated as a woman, absolutely equal with a man, such a culture has not understood the true nature of man and the true nature of woman. Man and woman are two equal halves of one whole. When single and alone, the man is manifesting but one aspect of his source of being. And when woman lives alone and single, she also manifests but one aspect of her source of being. <laughs>